And I'll go dark once you actually start, Jim. Morning, if you're logging on, we'll be starting up in about four minutes. Top of the hour. We'll be starting up the webinar in about three minutes, just letting people log in. Welcome to those joining us uh, live on Facebook. We'll be starting up in about not quite two and a half minutes. We'll be starting up in about two minutes. For those who are joining us, if you want to download the workshop manual for the full Snow and Ice workshop, you can do so at the uh, link in the chat pod. The chat will be disabled for you to put things in, but we may put notes there for you. About one more minute, we'll get started right at the top of the hour. It's nine o'clock. Hey, it's nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. So good morning. And uh, welcome to uh, Topical Tuesday webinar. I'm David Orr. I'm the director here at the New York LTAP Center, New York State LTAP Center, the Cornell Local Roads Program. And uh, we're going to be doing a session today on snow plowing and removal. Uh, at the end of the hour, we'll give you a list of other webinars that we're doing through the rest of this month and uh, into the beginning of uh, March, actually. So uh, good timing. We have snow all in the area, and we're welcome to joining us. Uh, go to the next slide there, Jim. Uh, now, this webinar uh, will get you one uh, point towards Roadmaster recognition for those of you who are in our Roadmaster program. And uh, if you're not a member, please let us know. We can help you out there. Uh, it skipped past all the stuff that we do, but we can let you know if you're in, not in Roadmaster, please let us know. We'll get a letter to your supervisor. It's a way to sort of show that you're trying to move things forward. So uh, if you're interested, just send us an email. We'll list our email at the end of this hour. Now, for those who are joining us and haven't been on one of these before, 
Uh, the chat is disabled for you to put things in, but we may send you messages via the chat. If you have a question, um, please put it in the Q&A pod. You'll click that at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you may be asked to raise your hand. Uh, if you are, there's just a raise hand feature. So as an example, just to show you how this works, uh, is it snowing where you are right now? Raise your hand and we'll see how many people raise their hand here. May not be snowing yet. I know the snow's coming. We got one raised hand, two. Okay, so we got good timing there, Jim. Got a couple of people and I know snow is coming. It's definitely on the radar screen, so we'll get some snow here. Okay. Uh, with that, next slide there for me. Okay, so we're going to get started. Jim Craw is our instructor. I'll let him give more of a background, but he's got many years working with a couple of villages and has been doing our snow and ice training for quite a while. So, uh, Jim, it's uh, your hour. We'll let you take it away. And uh, we'll be in the background watching for questions and answers. If we need to, we'll bring them in. And good luck. Have, have a good hour. Thank you, David. Uh, welcome, everyone that's out there and wherever you are. Um, like it says, I'm Jim Craw. Uh, I've got about 40 years of snow and ice experience. Town of Manlius, uh, village of Fayetteville, uh, village of Manlius. And I've been doing the circuit rider program for uh, about, I think it's six years now. But, uh, you know, I've been involved in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different programs, uh, federal highways, uh, APWA, Winter Conference, done uh, a few things out there. NICOM, anybody's been in NICOM meetings and I've done some of the, the uh, Cornell Local Roads program, the, the annual in June down at uh, Ithaca. So that's my, where I've been. Uh, the program today is the uh, snow and ice removal, uh, the, the physical side of it. We won't do any any or very little chemical stuff today. The chemicals are in the next uh, next program coming up in a week or so or two weeks here. Basically, you know, this is what you'll see in the Adirondacks, Fontag Hill, and some of the, the hilly areas, you're gonna get these big double wide plows. So, you know, you have to be careful. Uh, when we're doing snow plowing, um, it's the it's mechanical removal of snow and ice accumulated on road surfaces. Um, with the right equipment, you know, it makes the material go faster, it come off the roads faster, and ends up with less product on the road, less snow on the road, and a lot easier for the chemicals to work after we we remove the snow. So we need to be as efficient as we can to um, remove the remove the snow from the the roads. And there's a, a few new, newer um, products out on the line online today that actually were brought up a long time ago, but now we're started to figure out uh, ways to make them work for us. A little background on where we were snow plowing years ago. This is where they plowed the roads. Um, not all the roads ever got plowed all the time. They all, you know, were taken care of, but you didn't expect to have bare roads at all. Uh, prior to this, what they used to do is roll the roads with big rollers with horses. They'd make ice roads out of everything. You know, you can see where they were back in the day compared to what you've got today with your, your trucks with heat, cabs, you know, there's a two horsepower. We're looking at, you know, four or 500 horse in the trucks today. <clears throat> uh, next version of this plow came along. Um, as you can see that the plow basically is almost part of the truck. The, the push frame was extended all the way to the rear wheels, similar to the way that the Walters, the Oshkosh, the FDWDs all had their plows to carry the load and carry the, the shock all the way back to the rear axle. Kept the plow in, in fairly decent. As you can see, the plow is adjusted like not, um, and it always left snow on there. There's no, no heat in these cabs, wooden cabs inside. Um, so these guys are pretty, pretty, uh, 
pretty tough. They had no power steering, um, small engines, but you know, compared to today, you know, we're in a different world today. Another option was the belly scraper, belly plows, which basically everybody, pretty much everybody had gone away from for years. And you'll see as we go down through that the belly, belly plow is coming back um, because it'll scrape that extra snow off on the road for you. The equipment that we use and what we're gonna go through is the types and functions, uh, cutting blades and edges, shoes and casters, uh, trip mechanisms, uh, special purpose plows. Basically, it's the plows that we use today and have been used for years, but a lot of things are changing in the, in the technology and the, um, and the thought of, of how we're doing our business. Just some examples of some one-way plows, also called cone plows. These plows were basically on every truck out there for years. Um, these plows came in a variety of, of different configurations where you have a low speed, a high speed, and um, they could also end up being a, a V-type plow or you've seen some of them where they have uh, plows with the, the cast off in the center center lanes so that the snow can be pushed up on e in either direction. But these pretty much were the standard for years. Um, they're an excellent plow, they're, they're heavy. They actually scrape down on the, on the road a little better in, in most cases, but they're also the best plow that you've got for um, shelving or benching because the snow will come up into the end of the barrel. As you can see on these, you come up in the barrel and it'll get up over the over the banks. It casts the snow higher and further back. And where the wing plow or the swivel cast plows basically have to you have to pinch the plow against the bank to uh, to get the snow to come up over the top of it. Reversible plows are pretty much get, that I've seen around the state uh, in the last, I don't know, 15, 20, 20 years probably, have almost become the standard. The uh, swivel plow or swivel cast basically can take the snow to the right or the left, wherever you would like it. It's nice if you have large intersections, end of runs. Um, they're pretty good if you've got hardback uh, because you can angle that plow back almost towards straight, which becomes a, a, a bulldozer type plow and it will, will can and will bite into the ice if you have hardback. Um, the only problem is that if you, normally if you come off in the your right or left full swing, the plow have a tendency to chatter. It'll jump and hop and pop and uh, it'll trip on you. Uh, so you have to be careful of, of you know, how that's adjusted. Uh, the adjustment of these plows, there isn't a lot of adjustment in them. You can't really roll them over other than change the hole on the uh, push frame. Uh, but it's basically the plows that were on like a bike or a uh, Fisher Western, you know, pickup truck, truck, truck type plows. They work very, fairly well. Um, heavy snow, they get a little bit, you know, they can they can send you off in a hurry. But they, they work well on, on general snow. Since we're not getting a lot of huge heavy snows anymore, these work all well. Like I said, very good in intersections because you can straighten the plow out and push across an intersection and not have that big of a windrow. Or you can split the, the snow right and left with a wing on your plow your truck so you can kind of take some of the stress off in that vehicle. Wing plows, um, not everybody uses wing plows, um, but they're extremely nice because you can get the extra width on your roads and you can also um, cut or shelf or bank or, or uh, bench with them. 
mostly uh, what I see in most villages and, and some uh, populated areas, they won't use a wing plow because they're just too wide for a lot of the uh, a lot of the roads. We always did because we used to get a lot of snow here. Our average snow was has been about 110 inches a year. We're down from that quite a bit today, but you know who knows by the end of the week we may be there. It doesn't sound like a huge storm, but we're going to probably get around six inches. They say. Um, these are the wing plow configurations. These are some of the configurations. You have a benching, a benching wing. That means that the uh, the back end of the plow, the, the toe of the plow, the, can come up and it has braces on it. The braces can be adjusted. In this case on the right, bottom right, we call those the guts. Those can be pulled up, up and down and that'll bring that wing in towards, towards the truck. And then you'll raise your nose of the plow up or your wing up and that'll that'll bring the, the, uh, the wing up into position to be to bench. There's a lot, a lot of people going to the, um, the stationary wing where there's no, you don't adjust up and down with it. It's either on the ground or it's in, in the, uh, the carry position. It used to always have a cable over the top to carry the, the uh, tail of the wing. And now they've gone hydraulics on a lot on most of them. So you don't have that other extra adjustment. They're, the wing can be used for a lot of a lot of things when you're doing this in the snow removal. The only thing you have to be careful over the wing is what's out in the bank. Fire hydrants, tree stumps, um, fences. Um, what we did with our wing trucks because we found that we didn't have the drivers we used to have um, at the villages is we ended up putting cameras on the uh, on the, the front wing post or the front of the truck and the camera could show inside the truck where the wing had run. So you actually get to see what you hit after you went by it. Since we now have started to go away from two person plowing, we're going back, going to the single person. It gives you a little, little better feel of, of what's on that right hand side of the truck. When you come out, out of the, uh, uh, through intersections or try to back, back up and around, we put them on the wing wing side, we put them on the rear of the truck, and we've also put them on the top of the sander boxes so that we don't have to climb up on the sander anymore. And we had an issue where a guy fell down through one of the grates, checking his load, ended up snapping his shin pretty bad. Um, so we put cameras up there so that we don't have to, to get up on the tops of the trucks so much. One other thing with all, the, all your plows, we need to check the plows before we go on a, on a run. The truck should be, you should take a walk around the complete truck and um, make sure all the bolts are in place. All, if you have cables, they're all in place. No hydraulic leaks. Um, and just make sure everything is in fairly good condition. Um, there's been cases where we've gone out a bunch and come back in and then went back out the next morning. Uh, the guys didn't check their trucks well and pins were missing out of the front plow and the front plow would swing around and then end up ripping a frame off or, or those, those kind of things. Something with a wing plow that you wanna make sure of is whenever you're using that wing, there should be tension on the wing when it's down. If it's not down, in, in the float position at least, and then have a stop on the bottom of your, your wing so that the, the wing can't slide out of the, out of the uh, front post. Because if, if it does, it comes totally off in the truck and, and, uh, and wipes, wipes everything out alongside the truck or underneath the truck. One other thing with those, with the wing plows, if you're gonna, when you're picking the plow up, that wing up, 
you always pick up the nose first so it doesn't dig in and then the tail and the same thing when it goes to the ground it should be tail first nose second otherwise what will happen is it'll, it'll drive into the ground as you can see on the left hand side top left corner that's what will ha what'll happen is you drop that nose in and it'll dig right into the into the asphalt or dirt road or whatever road you have so you have to be careful of that if it does dig in at any time what will happen is it is it'll come up and it'll slap the the uh, window or the uh, mirror on the passenger side and if you're lucky that's all it'll do if not other than that it'll rip off and, and swing out around underneath your truck with a wing plow if you do have a um, a movable wing it can be sucked into you what i mean is sucked in is like like on the top left side make sure that you've got tension on the front of that that nose plow off the ground just a hair because the sharper the angle the easier it is for that front of that plow the wing to go in and when it does go in like i said you'll have an awful mess um, different configuration of trucks out there available today. This truck, uh, I'm not, I think it's over in Europe, but they're being used more and more in the Midwest and Canada. What happens here is it takes all the way to that, that front right spring on your truck away from the, the, uh, the problem of having it break. It puts the weight on the rear axles the rear back, the back of the truck. So that takes a lot of that tension off the front. It also takes that cantilever situation away from the truck where your traction is if you've got everything in the air. Because all the weight on the, all the weight from the plows are on the front of the truck and it takes away from the traction from the rear of the truck. With these, it holds it in a lot better. Um, we've gone to those, so I have a picture of it later on in a Ford 550 that we use we started out with uh, three six-wheeler plow trucks, and they're down to one now. And the other is made up by three small 550 Fords for the village that can get around a lot quicker. And they also plow around 12 foot wide, so you really don't lose anything on your plow and wing. If anybody has any questions, you know, you know, please, uh, you know, throw them at David, and then. We'll, uh, we'll talk about them as they come up. Uh, blade types. Um, when I say blade types, it's cutting edge. Um, type, of, type of cutting edges, uh, rubber, polymer, plastic, um, sliding segments, uh, multiple stacked blades, cold steel and carbide. Most people have been using or started to head towards carbide a little more. They're a little bit more expensive. The good good side of it is that the mechanics don't and the, the drivers don't have to change the uh, cutting edge as often. But there's a there's a there's an other side of that that um, a lot of people need to start realizing. If is that if we use carbide, carbide is harder than any of the stone that we use on the road. Carbide will take off. Um, pavement markings. They will chip stone off if you use uh, uh, chip seals. Um, they'll take off high spots in the road. So you have to figure out, is it worth the extra money for the carbide? Or do you want to replace a, a section of road because you know your, your blades are too, too aggressive? Cold steel were the standard for years. They have to be they have to be changed out. Um, also the cold steel, a lot of the cold steels are, are double edged so that you can use half and then flop the blade over and then and replace the blade. And you know, use it a second time, the second half, that should get you through, in most cases, nearly a season or two seasons. Carbides, I'm being told that these, some guys are using it for three or four seasons, which is fine. Absolutely, absolutely fine. 
but you know you have to look at both sides of it whether it's going to tear your roads up um, if it's real cold out below zero 20 below zero and you hit the manhole with a carbide or something really hard you'll have a tenant they'll have a tendency to crack it or take a section right out um, because the steel is so so dense and hard um, sliding segments that's a that's getting to be one of the new technologies um, what that does is it follows the the uh, elevation of the road and if you have sections of roads that have uh, tire wear a lower section of the road then the segment will drop into that lower segment and the other segments will slide up so that it will follow the contour of the road which actually gets you gets more snow off the road um, than it would if it was just a solid the only thing with those two is that if it's really cold and you get slush and it freezes sometimes those segments don't don't move like they should um, rubber polymer and plastic blades rubber blades have been used for quite a few years they're kind of like a squeegee. They will work. They have a tendency to, to chatter because they, they, they can move. Um, there's polymer, the, the rubber also has come along with a, an insert to it where there's some, some metal in it. So it's, it's stiffer or there's stacking type where they stack multiple blades together where you can put a rubber blade in the the carbide, uh, you know, with backing, or there's some uh, ceramic type inserts that go into some of these blades. There's pretty much anything you'd want to use or have with them. Um, the polymer or plastics really don't go last very long because of the weight of the, the plow. Basically, with the heat, it just it just melts the plastic down fairly quick especially if you have an open course um, road. So the, you know, these are types of cutting edges um, that most, most everybody uses. I'm sure there's some other stuff out there we haven't seen yet because as everybody knows, everybody tries to do something a little bit different <clears throat> than somebody else trying to save a buck or just trying to make a better, you know, like David has his, the program to build a better mousetrap. You can you can adjust these things any way you want to and make them make them into your own, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. If it works for you, that's exactly where you should be. But you also have to make sure that you're you're efficient with the use of it, and uh, you, they have to be they have to be renewable. These are the materials for your cutting edges. Um, you have your steel, your carbide inserts, uh, ceramic inserts, rubber, and polymers. The bottom left is a rubber cutting edge. Um, you always put a steel plate across the face of it to keep it in place. To, like I said, the only problem is they wear, they, they chatter, and they'll have a tendency to, to uh, tear, rip. Um, they do work. They work well. Um, especially in slushy slushy material after a storm they just don't bite in and they don't don't grab as hard as they, you would like them to the one in the center the yellow one in the center bottom is a polymer um, we've used those on sidewalk plows and lightweight plows because we don't have the huge amount of weight you know pushing down on them they clean sidewalks fairly well they're forgiving when you hit a an expansion joint or something like that. Uh, the right hand side, bottom right with a pickup to the one ton in there. That's the the polymer. That's the polymer stack. The one on the right, top right, is a carbide uh, or ceramic rubber combination. Uh, they work fairly well. They, you know, they're, they're stiffer than the normal rubbers, but they, they will work. Uh, I don't know if I have another slide of another one. 
Like the ones at the top are basically a cold, cold steel. Um, and they work, they work well. They were the old, they're the old standard. Also back with the other pictures, that you, whenever you buy a, a, a blade, a cutting edge, you got to make sure that you get the right stamp because the holes are all stamped for different, different uh, plows. A lot of the plows are finally gone standardized with, with stamps so you can use different different blades on or cutting edges. But, you know, that's uh, that's the way it, you know, it always worked. Uh, multiple blade project. What this is, what has happened now and in the past, they're basically old ideas coming out of Europe and Canada mostly. But now all the, the US companies are, are putting these plows together in one configuration or another. What you see is the, the right hand side on the first plow, first the orange picture on the left is your cutting edge in, in to the right. That's your standard cutting edge. And these are pretty much all on uh, swivel cast plows. And then behind that is a scare fire. It's a wire mesh or a screening normally. And you can see that on the picture on the right, it's the blue. And behind that is a squeegee to pick up the excess that comes underneath the plow, that, that squeezes under the plow. They're effective um, for hard pack. Um, they do work on you know, normal play, normal plowing. But what you have to be aware of is that you're putting a lot, a lot more weight on that front plow. You know, there's a lot more steel out there, so that that changes your your weight of your truck as far as where that, where you're plowing, how you're plowing. Uh, these are all, these are three configurations of, of different types of plows that basically all do the same. Um, so you, you know, you, you have to make sure that everything is in place. Some of these units, the one on the right has an, you can adjust the, your, uh, the back side of your, your two, two extra blades so you can pick them up or take them down. They don't have to be all the way down all the time. So, you know, there's different adjustments. The other project that's out there is, I don't think I have a picture of it. But this is a, just a different configuration of the same ones that we just looked at. The original plows, this is the way they came. You've got a cutting edge on the right, you've got a scare fire in the center, and then you've got a, a slush blade behind it. This this unit you can take up and down, different pressures, or you can just not have it there anymore. Like I said, most all these are on um, swivel cast plows, reversibles. They do work. The other, the other, the newer version is a single that your your normal plow blade with a normal cutting edge. And behind that is a segmented, segmented um, plow section, which would be like the slush rubber on your on the, these, this unit here. And that's that's in sections. That'll follow the contour of the road. The the sales people, their promotion on it is it'll get 30 to 40 percent more of the snow off the road because it's it's being taken away by a second second blade right behind the first blade. Um, in effect, basically, you've got you can do the same thing if you have an under belly plow. Um, but I know Henderson, uh, Viking. I'm not sure if Everest has them yet or any of the other ones, but I know that those two for sure do. I've been I've talked with those two uh, manufacturers. But they do have, you know, they seem to be doing well. Um, I think the state of New York has bought some of those other, those newer plows. Um, basically, it's a, and we'll see what happens. It, it, it's got to do better than what we had. Um, but one of the things we also have to realize is if we were going to, the only true way to remove snow 
the most efficient way to, to get the snow off the road is to plow it. If we don't plow it, then we, soon enough, what we end up with is hard pack. Um, I know a lot of places have um, standards where they don't go out until after there's two or three or four inches. The only issue, the biggest issue with that, that weight program is that you're gonna allow the traffic to get to the road before you put it, get any, get the snow off it or get any material on the bottom. The longer you wait, the more that you hard pack you're gonna have. The more hard pack you have, the longer it's gonna take you to get that material off the road. So if you get the material off the road, as soon as you can, as it's coming down, I'm not saying jump every time it snows, but I'm saying like at night, you can wait until that morning shift, um, three or four o'clock in the morning, get them off the road, get the snow off the road so that the traffic doesn't get to it. If the traffic gets to it, it's gonna pack down. And anybody that's had hard pack knows that it takes two to three times longer and more, more de-icing material to get the roads back to normal. So you wanna get on those roads as soon as you can and get as much material as you can. One other thing is that with, with plows, um, I think I've got a, yeah, these plows here that are some of the newer styles for the swivel cast. Um, Clear Roads did a study on, on the plowing. Actually, they have a very good manual on it. Um, you can go online and, and get that. Um, some of the problems were that they had a lot of snow coming back around the plows and, and uh, it was getting in the air and it was like a snowstorm behind the trucks. To eliminate some of that, <clears throat> what, you, what you can do is you can put a, a rubber across the face of the, uh, the plows to keep the, plow, the snow down instead of letting it become airborne and, and uh, come around the back of the truck and then get back on the road and a chance to freeze behind it. But basically, these are all just prototype plows that we're looking at today. Um, they've been used for a long time um, and I, I think they'll keep coming. One other thing that's happening with plows is there's a, there's a plow, a few plows out there now. There's a, some salespeople are trying to promote. Um, they're ground pressure sensitive plow where you adjust the plow so it doesn't really go full weight onto the road. It keeps it up just a little bit for less wear of the uh, cutting edge. I don't know how good that would be because if something, if it gets up, then how's it gonna, how's it gonna get everything off? Because you need the weight to go down to the ground to scrape. Um, I haven't seen any here, but I've heard some, some talk about them being around. Underbody plow, basically underbody plow is a grader blade. It's a grader blade that you can put underneath your truck. Um, had been used in the, in the North in Canada um, for a long time because they had a lot of hard pack. Um, you can get these grader blades basically where you can put, get down pressure on them. They originally were designed for alleyways, streets, and cities, um, but now they've they've come back again for a second plow underneath your truck. They have, you can do basically they're set up just like a grader. Some have a swivel capability. Um, some have just a, they just drop down with the, by gravity and stay on the ground. Others have down pressure. The ones with down pressure, you have they have to be very careful of because you can get so much pressure on that that you can literally lift the truck off the ground. So you really probably wouldn't want that kind of pressure, but you know, and they can be adjusted for for the angle. Uh, your pitch on it can roll back and forth to a, to a bulldozer style, or like you see in this one here, it's just a squeegee style. Um, I was out in uh, Michigan a few years ago at a, a, a snow conference at APWA. 
Um, and I came back across the, through Canada and on 104 in Canada, there was a 10 wheeler going down that shoulder really slow and I couldn't figure out what this guy was doing. It was uh, April, I guess, May. And what they were doing with it, they were cutting the shoulders with that, with that 10 wheeler with the bottom that belly scrape. Another way to use your, you know, multi, multi-purpose. So they were originally for urban streets, alleyways, um, that kind of thing. It's it's good for slush, you know, picks that slush up, gets rid of that that loose stuff that's on the road and gets it to the shoulder, gets it off the off the driving lane. It does work quite well. Reduces wind rolls, it's the snow that comes around the uh, around the plow between the plow and the wing, or even just a single plow. Good in light snow conditions, as you can see, you know, you could use that straight without having much else on the ground, but it's not for heavy snow. They, they, they just don't work well there. Um, some rural settings, you know, you may want to use it on a dirt road or something like that where you want to get a little bit more off. Um, you know, it's all, it's all whatever, whatever the application works for you. That's the one to use. Hey, Jim. Yes. Had a question. Somebody wanted to know who made that box, I guess, the uh, side spinner equipment. Um, I don't know whose unit that is. I'll tell you what. Do uh, you think we could find out afterwards? Basically, I think if you were to look at um, Henderson, or uh, actually all, almost all of the all of the um, vendors now that are supplying trucks have live there. It's a live bottom and it's a side, it's a front delivery package is basically what it is. Okay. So, you know, with the new live bottoms, the nice part about those is that you can actually set those up so that you can deliver to the rear or you can deliver to the front, depending on, you know, where you want it to come. Right, where your spinner is change your hydraulics to, to run forward and reverse. Okay. And so that's, you know, I can't tell you exactly, but it's a LaRoche. So I'm guessing it's probably out of Canada. Yeah, I, that, that part I figured. I don't know. Okay. Well, we can look at it later if we if we can figure it out, but thanks, but that's good enough for now. You got about uh, 20 minutes, Jim. And like I said, they're pressure adjustable so that you can put pressure down and you can swivel them. Um, I may have a picture that reversibles, like I said, you can you can get these set up so that you can do it just about any way you want to go. Um, they do a lot of different things. Wing plows, we talked about those a little bit. Um, <clears throat> wing plows, there's a lot of different configuration of wing plows. Um, wing plows can be there's some great designs and there's some some designs that, that aren't great. And most of the good designs are the old style wings that we used to have years ago because it used to take the snow and, and roll the snow up and cast it over the top of the banks. Um, the newer the newer wings, the best way to get the snow over the top of the bank is to it has to be pinched against the bank and then it'll cast over the top. There's different heights of them. Um, I know the standard postal service height is 42 inches high to get underneath them for post for mailboxes. Some of these wings are, are pushing 50 inches high. So the, that standard doesn't work very well if you're trying to get underneath the underneath a, a mailbox. Because um, mailboxes are one of our, our biggest pains. Uh, it gets knocked down and they want it fixed. Um, controller made a ruling that we're not supposed to be really fixing <coughs> mailboxes because it's not public property. And it's in our easement. 
the easement is the edge of the road and that easement's there partially for snow snow removal for stacking snow and you know those kind of public things but like i said there's different styles of wings there's wings on the right and left side of the trucks there's midship wings those are the ones that are on the back end of the truck and then there's the front front wings on there's also the other type of wing another type of wing is a rotary wing if you've ever seen one it's kind of neat <clears throat> what happens is the snow is plowed up pushed out to the end of the wing the, the, the farthest point out and at that point there's a big rotary uh, snowblower type hydraulically driven snowblower thrower on the end of it and it'll ca it cast the snow off the off into the, the lots that's great until you find a uh, a uh, fence because the fence has a tendency to find those things and gets wadded up pretty good one other thing with the wing plows if you don't have a lot of snow you will you probably don't understand wouldn't understand but if you have windrows on the side of the road that are that are too high for your your plows to push over and you start cutting benching shelving whatever the terminology you use is and when you're you're cutting you want to make sure that you don't cut down to the ground you usually want to leave about a foot of snow on the ground on the shelf because the chances are if you get another snow anytime soon that's of any any volume what'll happen is you'll your driver will lose the edge of the road and those banks are are good plow markers they'll keep you on the road or keep you in the road if you take them all the way back out you know and, and get them down to the ditch level then you're probably going to end up in the ditch before the winter's over <clears throat> um, large volumes of snow when you start get drifting and you're you're talking about eight ten foot drifts um, you can shelf those in, um, cut them back, cut them back, and then eventually you'll end up doing something different. We'll show you later with the, with the rotary. But you can, as long as you keep your banks loose, and that's one, one thing that a lot of people don't do. They may shelf, but they won't rework the, work that snow after it's already been placed. And, it, and if you don't rework the snow, turn it over, What'll happen is it'll harden up. It'll become solid ice. And when you do get in the wing right off the truck or you'll break cables, you'll break the front right, right springs on your trucks. There's just so much tension on those, that right-hand side of the truck. One problem with it that has always been is when you get into a bank, that wing will want to drag the truck down it'll pull that right side down because that's the plow is designed to dig in and as it digs in it'll pull that wing down and it'll put huge tension on your your cables if you have cables if you have hydraulics it'll still put a lot of tension on the outside of that that, that wing if you have patrol wings you don't have to worry about that because you can't there's you can't caught with those all you're going to do is just flat plow Um, this is the state DOT truck with a, with a wing and a plow. <clears throat> um, the bottom is the position you're going to be in when you're driving. You know, your cable is fairly tight. You don't let it flop around too much. The same thing with the front. It needs to be fairly tight. It needs a little tension on it. Two reasons. One reason is because it can dig in if it's, if it's not. And the second reason is it also gets you a little bit of weight on that front steering axle. If you, if you find you can't turn, the best thing you can do is just touch the front plow just a little bit up, give it a couple jabs. It'll put weight on that front steering axle and you'll be able to turn a lot easier. Um, 
talking about that kind of stuff. Uh, your wing, when you're in the cut position or shelving position, your arm, your braces, like in the second picture, or the, the second down, basically that that position right there, what'll happen is if you get into some heavy snow, those that plow is gonna come back up into the truck. The reason for that is the angle of attack on those braces. When you cut, your braces should be about the same angle as it is when it's flat on the ground, like the top picture. If it's if the if the wing has a chance to come up, because there's no down pressure into that, it's going to make that wing come back up into you, and you'll lose all the snow that you had when you were uh, when you're cutting. So you need a, just a small down angle, or flat at least, and it'll keep the weight of that that plow down into that wing down into the into your bank. Different configuration, you know, bigger wing. Um, we all, anybody that had any snow knew that you had to have a all wheel drive, um, FWD, Walters, Oshkosh, something Mac with the, with the front drive. But with the advent of the 10 wheeler, the uh, those bigger turtles, basically, I call them, would become obsolete because these 10 wheelers with a load of, load of material on the truck will stay into a bank much better than the, uh, the older trucks. The only thing, they may not take quite the beating they took when you had a, a lot of snow um, fill a road up with uh, drifting. But we have other other means to do that now. The newest thing on the on the market came out of the Midwest was the uh, trailer plow. The state has these at all their facilities, at least one, sometimes two. Um, these this trailer plow, these trailer plows will activate within six seconds from all the way in, all the way out. You have liquid or a sander on the back on the trailer. And then you have a full complement of plows on the front. They'll do two and a half lanes, um, great on 81, but you know they're only like 30 mile an hour. So fast, fast plowing is extremely dangerous to you and and everybody else, and it's not very effective if you're doing 50 miles an hour down the road because that plow is hopping and jumping. So you're really not doing a whole lot. You're getting your route done fast, but you're not you're not doing yourself any favors because you're leaving a lot of material on the road. So that you you know, ideal speeds are have always been said to be eight to eighteen, and you can ball one five now. And most places, if you're doing much more than that, like I said, you're just you're just running the roads. You're not doing much for you. These plows have, have been around for a while. Um, they started on 81 a few years back, uh, and all the naysayers started screaming and hollering, there's going to be a lot of accidents, causing accidents. Um, they only had two accidents with it, and neither one of them were um, caused by the truck. They were just people driving, bailed out, dove off into the ditch. You know, for no reason. <clears throat> um, accessories, plow shoes. My recommendation is to put shoes on everything. Um, casters aren't very good. They're good for like uh, airport plows and such, but not, not for anything else. Um, shoes should be changed when you change blades, your cutting edge, um, because they wear down and the adjustment on these should be just touching the ground when, they're, when they're, the blade is, is working. Basically what they're there for is to keep you from digging into the, the asphalt. Side flanges, um, very similar to a box scraper. Um, it's nice if you have something like this, it can stop you from building wind rolls. Um, you know, these are the Removable type that you can drop down and pick up, which are extremely handy, especially if you're you're in in the cities and stuff like that would be would be great. 
Um, although everybody's heard, you, you know, can't you go the other way in front of my house or can't you pick the plow up so that you don't put snow in my, uh, in my driveway because I have to shovel it five times. Well, you have to shovel five times, I probably have to plow it six because after you get done, you throw everything in the road. That would just, it's just a help. Plow accessories, curb guards, um, they're okay. Um, I've had some good and bad experience with curb guards. They do save the plow uh, to wear the wearing on the uh, cutting edge if, you're, if you do run into curb. But other than that, they're just another piece on the, on the vehicle. These snow deflectors are what I was talking about with the snow not going around the truck. Um, what helps is it doesn't get back up on the on the windshield and freeze. You know, it can keep you back, keep the snow down rather than coming over the top. The other thing we have the problem with is snow coming off the back edge of the plow. That's what gets on the, the cab. There's a pinch area right in behind the behind your cutting edge. As you're going along, it'll, it throws the snow back up from the bottom, not necessarily always from the front. This is what I was talking about with the, when you get too much snow, you get into blowers. Blowers are fantastic, but the biggest problem with them is you're only going to use them maybe for a week, a year, and you're caught talking two, three, four hundred thousand dollars what a lot of places have gone through now is get a loader that uh, blower that goes on a loader, front, front end loader. They work very well. They're a lot easier to get unstuck. These things, once they go in, they're, they're not good. Um, v plows on graders, V plows on, on um, loaders. Fantastic equipment. You can put a lot of snow away with something like this. I mean, a lot of snow because it's so long and it's heavy. Basically, what this is going to just shows the inside controls on it, like a 550. Um, this has got ground speed control, and all the controls for your plows are right off of there. Front plow basically is is this type of plow, and it's just a normal plow. And then the, your wing is on this. This wing will go up nine inches, so you can actually cut with this one. Um, this has liquid on board. It's a it's a great truck, great little truck. Some of the plowing things we had, you know, we have one of these at Fayetteville because we're doing away with the uh, the bigger trucks. We can go out and cut two to three times faster with a grader or with a loader than we can a um, <clears throat> a truck. Because one man, he's got full control of the wing. You can put it wherever you want to put it. And it would really... Uh, Really helped us a, a huge amount. Um, we can go out one one person can go out with that and cut cut everything we had, and you know be back further than we could even with our trucks because uh, that's a 14 foot wing on it, so we can reach out and get where we want to get to. We just had to be careful who we sent because some of our people drive by fire hydrants and such every day and don't even realize that they're there. They don't think about stuff like that. Another thing I wanted to, to, to mention, um, we have these great things that they, they're putting in um, called roundabouts. Roundabouts um, are mostly on state roads and county roads right now, but they're, they want to put them in a lot of places. Roundabouts, if you haven't seen them, they're basically an intersection. They've made a circle on them. They make a circle so it's an enter and exit so they don't have to have control devices. The center section of that roundabout, I don't know if anybody ever plowed, any engineers ever plowed them, but if you plow that roundabout in the direction you're supposed to plow it to the right, when you go around to the right and you're, you're in, going in a circle, instead of plowing 14 feet wide, you're only plowing about 10. Because as you go around to the right, the angles of the plow decrease. 
if you could go to the left, the wrong way around it, you could plow a, the full width of the, the plowing wing. But the problem with that is that you're not supposed to put stack the snow in the center of the roundabout because when it starts melting, it becomes a, 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 a ice. So if you've got those, you may have to find a different way to do how you're doing them. Um, I don't have a good answer, but I, you know they're out there, so we need to pay attention. We just want to be careful, of, you know, where we put the snow on those. Jim, Jim, just so you know, there are agencies looking at plowing into the center purposely, and they design them that way. Well, well as long as they've got the drainage for it, I guess it's fine. But That's what you got to think about. How are you yeah. going to plow them, and how are you going to maintain them? You probably have to have a bowl and a, a center drain somehow, <laughs> porous pavement, and, and get rid of it. But yeah, I mean, most of the ones that I see here around Onondaga County and, and where we are, they've, they've made them basically flat <clears throat> and just colored the centers in. Yep. So, There's some things we could talk about in another webinar we may. Yep. Uh, yep. What we recommend for folks with that is to plow the right because of traffic issues. You just go around it twice yep. to get yep. the full width. Motor grader, different types of teeth. I'm pretty much out of it here. This is just good for hard fact. Another example of the same thing. This rotary and then your V plows and then your blowers. If you start blowing, then you got to blow forever because you can't plow it after you blow it. Okay, David, this is my information. If you want need to get a hold of us, there we are. David, there you go. Okay, well, I go back up one slide real quick, if you don't mind, to our contact information. There you go. So if you've got any questions or interest, uh, please send us an email or give us a phone call. Uh, or you can even call Jim, he doesn't mind. Uh, just send him an email directly. We are doing another webinar, which uh, go to the next slide there, Jim, on the snow and ice area uh, on the February 16th. We actually have five other webinars after today before we start our spring training season uh, on asset management, drainage issues, uh, the chemical side of snow and ice, um, work zones, and then construction management. And we'll get you more details. You can also go to our website. And if you go to the next slide, uh, our spring workshop season, the registration form is out. Please sign up. We're still doing that hybrid approach for those who are interested. And Jim mentioned Build a Better Mousetrap. Uh, we're still looking for ideas to build a better mousetrap. And some of the best ideas we've gotten have been in the world of snow and ice. And then finally, if you want more details of anything we've talked about today, uh, feel free to go on our websites, uh, nysltap.cals.cornell.edu, or send us an email. And we will get uh, back to you as quickly as we can. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A pod real quick. We'll stay on for a couple of minutes to check that. And this will be recorded and uh, thrown up onto our website if you want to follow back up and look at something. And uh, thanks very much, Jim. Thank and, you. Uh, that's it, folks. Uh, you got good timing, Jim. It's starting to snow here in Ithaca, so. Perfect. Hopefully, hopefully they're ready. We don't have any snow here yet. So. I'll get there. It's coming here first. I know it's coming to you later. You get more than we do today, though. I hope. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to have it, might as well have enough to make it worthwhile. I agree. Okay. Well, with that, Jim, you have a great day. Everybody be safe out there. Don't crowd the plow. And uh, take care. Thank you.